Hello everyone, welcome back. I've got one final short little video here. This is the part four video for building blocks of arguments. And we've got to talk about um, evaluative terms and evaluative language as a part of arguing. And it's our final thing that we're um, training ourselves to listen for to be able to do this annotation exercise. To be able to pick out some of these basic moves that are a part of the activity of arguing. And evaluative terms might um, strike you kind of coming off as like, a little different than the other things that we've been uh, looking for that seem more explicitly um, arguing activities. But one of the reasons why we want to be tracking evaluative language very specifically will come to light uh, in our next module um, when we reconstruct arguments in a little more in depth. We'll want it'll be very important to track um, when evaluations are taking place in an argument um, for for a lot of reasons, but. We'll get into a lot of those details later. Right now, we're just going to try to uh, figure out what we're listening for and and how to go about that. Um, I before I forget, I want to give the code word for this video series. So there's going to again, there's just one quiz, just asking for one code word for all the four videos that were in this module, and I'll be giving you proportional credit for the. That'll uh, be for, worth four points this time since I had to make four videos of over three hours, so we're rounding up to four. Uh, so it'll be worth four points this time. Um, and the code word this time, let's do uh, let's do stars. I'm recording this a little late at night, and and the stars are really beautiful out here in Issaquah tonight. So uh, let's do stars. And um, little Luke was having he was like kept looking out the window, wanting to like look up. I don't think he can see the stars yet, but I was noticing them. So stars tonight is the code word. Um, for the video lectures uh, for building blocks of arguments. Okay, so let's get into it here with actually, you know, I am gonna I'm going to foreshadow some of the stuff we're going to talk about in the next module. I think I think this might be useful. Um, so I think I may have talked about this distinction between uh, normative and evaluative claims before, and the there's um, there's a reason why this distinction matters. Of, of all the claims that we can make. They come into these two categories. We can make evaluative, we can make normative claims, which are evaluative. They're claims about what's good and bad and right and wrong and appropriate or inappropriate or beautiful or ugly, anything like that that's evaluative. That's in the territory here of normative claims. And then we've got descriptive claims. And descriptive claims are just about how the world is. So um, science is in the business of studying descriptive claims, and that's kind of its domain. It can't really um, study morals for example, or ethics, it can study people's moral beliefs because you can, it's a descriptive matter whether I value something or whether I hold a certain moral principle. That's a descriptive claim about me and what my belief states are. But whether a, a normative claim, like a moral or ethical claim, is actually true is a matter of the value of things, not about how they are. Um, think about it kind of like this. Um, if you're wondering about this whole science connection. How does science proceed? Well, science proceeds by collecting observations as evidence. That's, that's why we call it empirical. Uh, empirical has to do with knowledge based on experience um, through observation. So uh, science is collecting observations. There's a lot of other things going on. We're actually going to talk about some of the um, patterns of reasoning that take place in science and some parts of it that maybe are more familiar in some parts I think that'll be less familiar when we get to that um, down the road here a little bit but all of its based on observations from experience and observations can only show you how things are and they can never show you how things ought to be there's a big gap between those we call this in philosophy the is ought gap um, I may have talked about all this before but I'm gonna repeat it anyway because this it's relevant again here so um, I'm getting a little weird deja vu thing going on but I don't know, I've talked about this so many times in lectures before, it might just be that, but it's worth repeating anyway. Um, so there's a big gap here between what is the case and what ought to be the case. Just because um, something is happening doesn't mean it's good, and just because something is not happening doesn't mean it's bad. It's kind of the same way that we would say um, just because something is good doesn't mean you, can, you should believe that it's going to happen. That's called wishful thinking, and we think of that as a major rational mistake. Well, it cuts both ways. Just because something is the case doesn't mean it ought to be the case. So 
inasmuch as um, empirical observation can only show us how things are, and science is just about what we can learn from observation of the world, then science isn't going to really be able to help us with morals. It's a different realm of, of reasoning, and it's a different realm of arguing. Um, there's a, an example I like to give of this. Again, I may have brought this up, but again, it's good to, this is good re, re, uh, rehearsing this again. It's fine to repeat it. Um, I like this argument as an example. Let's say I got some kids running around and one of them's hitting the other and I say you shouldn't hit your sibling. It's wrong to hit your sibling. And the kid asks why. Kids do that. Um, and I might give this argument. I might say well the reason, the premise for what that is the conclusion is that hitting causes pain. And no, let's notice something about the argument so far. The conclusion is normative. It's about what ought to happen, saying some, a certain action is wrong. The premise that I gave is just descriptive. Hitting causes pain. That's just a fact about how the world works. And, of course, you can complain and make objections to that. And I can clean up the case and make it, you know, not have those counterexamples. But generally speaking, hitting causes pain. You know, the behavior the kid is doing to the other kid is the behavior that generally causes pain unless the other child is in a suit of armor or something like that. So let's not worry about those wacky cases. Let's just stick to the standard ones. The kid might respond to me giving this argument and say, yeah, I know, that's why I hit them. Um, sort of showing how the fact that hitting causes pain doesn't really prove anything one way or the other in terms of what logically follows from that, just that concept, that being true doesn't prove that hitting is wrong unless it is accompanied with another premise because um, I think if we heard that argument we'd be like that yeah, makes sense to me hitting causes pain that's why it's wrong what more is there to say but what we're doing is we're taking for granted that causing pain to other people is wrong that's what allows the descriptive premise to do any kind of work in this argument is that we're taking for granted another normative premise so if you have a normative conclusion you always need to have a normative premise. But this is a perfect example of why we need to be on guard for evaluative language, because we leave it out so frequently. Um, we oftentimes leave it unspoken. Um, we never explicitly own up to the assumptions we're making, our ethical and moral assumptions. is something we very commonly do. Uh, even when we are um, speaking explicitly about our values and principles, we don't usually speak about why they're ultimately justified. We leave that gone. And I'd say in general, in my experience, um, people think more reflectively and critically about their beliefs about how the world works than their moral beliefs. That we just don't spend as much time being like, wait, am I right about that or not? Um, and we don't ask for evidence or justification for our moral beliefs quite as much as we do for descriptive claims. So that's another reason why we are going to want to be able to be watching when someone's doing this sort of thing because it's going to mean a different type of argumentation held to different types of standards. So, And because we leave it unspoken so frequently, that's going to be an issue. Um, part of the foreshadowing here for the next unit, one of the most difficult things that's going to happen in that module is that we're going to be taking this whole conversational implication interpretation thing to the totally next level when we're trying to reconstruct people's arguments. Just like we don't, we use implication to say a lot of the things that we're trying to communicate, when we're arguing, there can be a lot of implication present as well. And there can be parts of the argument that are actually there, even though they're completely unspoken. The fancy word for this is enthematic arguments. Um, but these are arguments that have, we're going to use a language of, have, we'll say they have suppressed premises. They have unspoken premises that are part of it. Like my argument, um, that hitting causes pain, therefore hitting is wrong, that has a suppressed premise there that we can kind of recover if we're listening carefully, critically, and charitably. So we'll be doing a lot of that in the next unit. And that's probably the most difficult thing. It requires the most judgment call on your part, but we're going to get some help here, and some of that help will come from being able to tag and flag a value of language when it's happening. So again, just like all the other annotations we're doing that we're training to do in this module, it's sort of uh, setting the landmarks for the next module when we're going to actually draw the full complete map. Um, but we'll need those landmarks in place first to kind of help us do that, to help us orient and, and put things into scope. So um, that's a little bit of where we're, where we're headed with this. There's not too much to say about um, 
uh, evaluative language itself here, there's just a few things to keep in mind. Um, some of it is really obvious. Certain words like, here, I'll, sorry for the real adjustment there. Um, my video cut out <laughs> right in the middle of me speaking. I, I don't really know why, but I fixed it now. Um, back at it. And as I was saying, some of the, some of the evaluative language, um, things that you need to be listening for, very obvious. Um, let me bring up the lecture notes. Um, some of it is just right, smacks you in the face. These words, like when I was talking about what, what are examples of normative claims, they use this kind of language. What's good and bad? What's right and wrong? What we should or should not to do? Ought to, ought not to, etc. Those are those are the really obvious and basic ones. Although even with these, there's one thing we always need to keep in mind when we're um, pardon me when we are um, annotating for normative claims. And actually, before we get into the trickier cases, let me illustrate this. Just because someone is using the word "good" doesn't mean you should flag it as a value of language. What we're really interested in tracking is people making normative claims in the kind of like in the kind of examples I was already talking about uh, again we're not really trying to do something mechanical here with these annotations I don't it's not a thing of like memorizing a list of words and then whenever you see that word flag it for that thing we want to be listening for a certain phenomenon a type of thing that we're doing in the course of arguing that we want to track in this case it's making a claim but a certain type of claim evaluative claims so when the person is evaluating um, or like making moral ethical those claims stuff like that that's what we want to be tracking for when we're evaluating things rather than just stating what we think is the case like facts and stuff like that this isn't a matter of the fact opinion distinction though that doesn't map onto descriptive normative that's that's I might go on a tirade about this so sooner or later I think there'll be the time that I'll talk about facts versus opinions but uh, I have a big axe to grind about that distinction. I don't think it's as useful as people think it is. But one, I, it's a very important trap to avoid. Don't think that normative is a matter of opinion and descriptive is the world of fact. Okay, but I will. I like. I just used fact as a way to talk about descriptive states of affairs, but that might be a more precise way of speaking it. There can be normative facts too. I mean, this is part of one of the things philosophers debate. Um, is there are there facts about moral and ethical matters the same way that there are facts about the descriptive universe and there's even questions about whether it's facts about the descriptive universe but we're not going to get into that right now big can of worms the point here is that I can use these words like good and bad and right and wrong without making a normative claim for example if I said something like uh, oh I don't know um, Sally likes Nicolas Cage movies. I don't think we have a Sally in this class. So if there is, I'm not speaking about you, Sally. It's just an example. Let's say I, I'm, I'm saying Sally um, Sally thinks Nicolas Cage is a good actor. Let's go with that as an example. Sally thinks Nicolas Cage is a good actor. The speaker, me, in this situation, is not saying, is not making any evaluation whatsoever. All I'm doing is making a descriptive claim about what Sally believes. Right? If I said, Nicolas Cage is a good actor, now I'm making an evaluative judgment. I'm the one doing it. I'm the speaker, me, making a normative claim. And the word, good, is what's really ultimately responsible for me doing that. But when I say something like, like in this example, if I'm talking about just what somebody else believes, um, then it's not going to be a normative judgment. Now, if I say, Sally is wrong to think that Nicolas Cage is a good actor, that would be a normative judgment. But not again on good, it would be on wrong, right? That's the thing that I'm committing to as a normative judgment. So watch out for that. Um, just because the language is involved doesn't mean it's going to be something to annotate for a value of language. It's, I only want you to be annotating when the speaker is advancing a normative claim. Sometimes that might not be easy to see, um, and that's why we have some of these other cases we have to talk about, but that's what you should be listening for. When do you think the speaker is making an evaluative judgment? That's what I want you to listen for. So there are some explicit words for this that help. Uh, they're a little more obvious with that other situation you know, in mind. But then there are these things that we um, sometimes call in philosophy thick concepts. These are words that, are, that have both a descriptive function to them and an evaluative normative function to them. And there's some great examples from the book. Um, I really like um, 
I really like these examples the book has about the invasion of Iraq versus the liberation of Iraq. Both of them refer to kind of military operations that took place in Iraq. That's a sort of the descriptive part. But, you know, invasion sounds bad. Invasions are bad. And liberation sounds good. Like, that's a good thing. See, those words are loaded with the value of content. But again, this is, this is where... Um, you know, we can talk about it at the study session, or as you're going over the homework, you can kind of see some of these things. But um, this is one of those things that calibrate your sensitivity to interpreting, is this evaluative or not? I, I've worked with students a lot on this, and this is one of the tricky spots. Um, just because you put a, a normative connotation onto a word doesn't necessarily mean that it's a thick concept and it's evaluative language and you should, you should um, flag it. The real tough... In the, in the fuzzier cases, you're having to make the judgment call. Do you think the speaker is intending to make a normative judgment? Are they using this language to suggest a normative, um, a normative inference or a norm, normative claim that they're trying to communicate or get the audience to kind of pick up on? Um, the, the use of thick concepts can be really sneaky. This is what we call spin doctoring. Um, when we uh, choose descriptive words that are going to cast that thing in a normative light, um, but we don't want to come out and explicitly use normative language, maybe because we don't want to be held accountable to those claims. It's kind of a sneaky way of of um, trying to like slip a normative claim past without it being too obvious. Because as soon as people say, that's good, or that's wrong, or something like that, then people are like, well, is it really? You know, I'm not so sure. I've got different opinions. But if you're like couching it, hiding the normative content into a descriptive fact, it's like, well, of course these events took place in history. You, those are undisputable. There's common rec uh, public records about all this stuff. Um, but the choice of words to describe it can have these writers. It's a very big thing that we want to be watching for. Because when we're doing the next unit and we're trying to split apart all the claims that are part of an argument, it might be that in just the same one, this one word, there's two things happening. There's a descriptive claim and a normative claim, and we're going to want to be able to pull those apart when we're listening. So that's another big reason for why we're annotating here for, for evaluative language, so we can track that, so we can see when that's happening. Um, there's a lot of things we use evaluative language for. Uh, these are some of the speech and conversational acts that are involved. Um, I'm not too big on this. Mostly, it's this. Um, this content's the big thing, is being able to calibrate your listening ear for when people are making normative claims. That's that's the big thing. There's some other things I could talk about here, but I'm gonna I'm trying to keep this video a little shorter. And before I end it, I want to kind of look over this exercise because like I said before this is this is exercise three from chapter four it's, it's in the assignment for the week or for the for this module um, and I am saying that this is pretty close except for the numbers this is pretty close to what will what you'll see on the exam I just want to point out a couple of examples here um, of a value of language um, Sometimes it can be really idiomatic. Um, this uh, lining the pockets right here, this one I think is a evaluative, um, and it's a evaluative negative. There's another way that they could have described um, the circumstance, the descriptive circumstances that are going on without necessarily coloring it in this way. But this whole, I don't know if you're familiar with this lining the pockets idiom, as I've kind of uh, taught this class before. I have some students are unfamiliar with it they don't, or don't necessarily know where this comes from, but this this idiom comes from um, imagining uh, dollar bills just sitting in a person's pockets rather than them they're actually spending it and using it. It's kind of like it's a it's an idiom of to talk about superfluous unnecessary wealth. That all it's doing is just sitting there in your pocket like a second lining to your pants pocket the paper of the money is like the second lining. Um, you don't need to line your pockets with cash. If you know if you you've got if you're getting money and you're not gonna be you don't need to do anything with it, um, then what's the point of that? It's kind of unnecessary wealth. Uh, the rich getting richer when they don't really need any more money already. That's where this idiom comes from. And it's got that kind of negative connotation to it. Unnecessary, unhelpful, 
those are normatively worded or uh, loaded words. So this one I think would qualify as evaluative negative, um, especially because and this is a good test. If you're trying to think, is, is the speaker trying to make a normative claim here? Well, if there's a more neutral way they could have worded it, then that probably is something you might want to identify as a value. Definitely, I would be leaning more in that direction with making that judgment call. If you're looking at the language and you're like, how could they make it any more neutral? I can't imagine a way. Then even if you've got some evaluative connotations with those words, probably shouldn't label it as evaluative. And that's what I think is going on here with this example of large corporations. I've had some students in the past be like, e-negative, because large corporations are evil. I'm like, how else is the speaker in this situation going to talk about these entities without using that word? I mean, what more neutral language could they offer um, that to, if, they're, if they were trying to avoid making a negative judgment here? Now, definitely in the context of this, um, the speaker is not really concerned about giving large corporations more money, but that action is the thing that they're evaluating. Not necessarily like large corporations are evil in themselves or bad in themselves or something like that. So um, keep that in mind. But here, like a word like poor, in context here, this is going to be e-negative, that being poor is not a good thing. When there's, a, that's a, this is, this is actually one of my favorite little, um, tips or tricks where, you know, and I know students always love like little techniques to try to help them make these judgment calls. And one of my favorites, I've been using this one for years, is if you think that there's an evaluative positive claim or evaluative negative claim going on, um, try rereading the sentence, putting uh, this kind of like a little aside in after the language that you think is positive or negative and see if it sort of sounds like what they are really trying to communicate. So like, this sort of, I'm imagining like blah blah blah, and that's a good thing, or blah blah blah, and that's a bad thing, that sort of thing. And if that feels natural, if that feels consistent with what you think they're communicating, then you're, you might be on the right track. So in this case, if you're looking at this whole thing, it may be a little early in, in the morning to bring this up, but if you buy coffee from large corporations, and that's a bad thing, it doesn't seem to really fit there. That doesn't, it, it doesn't, uh, doesn't seem, to my intuition, consistent with what they're saying. So, but, so let's, that's maybe neutral. But if you buy coffee from large corporations, you're inadvertently maintaining the system which keeps small farmers poor, and that's a bad thing, while lining the pockets of rich corporations, and that's a bad thing. Those little, and that's a bad thing, asides seem really natural here. This, these are claims that probably the speaker is trying to make as a part of their larger argument. It's important to their argument that keeping small farmers poor is a bad thing and that lining the pockets of rich corporations is a bad thing too and as much as it's unnecessary there's no good being accomplished by doing that whereas the small farmers are in need of that money that would really make a difference for their quality of life so that's another little tr trick that you can use here um, in, in trying to make these judgment calls about evaluative terms so I hope that helps you with evaluative terms that's all we've got here Again, the kind of the full suite of things that we're going to be annotating for, like that, that exercise is asking you to do, are going to be argument markers for premises or reasons, reasons markers or premise markers, however you want to write it, um, argument markers for conclusions or conclusion markers, assuring, guarding, discounting, and then evaluative positive and evaluative negative. Those are the seven things that we're that I'm going to be asking you to annotate for on the exam. You'll get a, a small passage of argumentative prose, and you'll you'll be asked to do that. Um, and you'll you I will not be um, I will not be uh, telling you which language to or what parts of the thing to pick out to give an answer to, like the way that happens in those exercises. You're going to have to pick it out of the whole thing. So that means you really want to be training your ear to listen for these phenomena um, rather than memorizing a list of words and doing this in a more mechanical way. The mechanical way might seem like you know, a shortcut, but it really isn't, and it's not going to help you in terms of using this stuff in the real world. You want to be able to listen for these, these dynamics happening, these, these movements for what they are, rather than kind of poking at them with this long stick of mechanisms um, you want to get right into it, be able to feel it out for yourself. So that, that's what I'm, I'm pushing for. 
Um, so I already gave you the code. So the code is stars. So there you go, code word. Um, again, I'm going to uh, post this up ASAP, and then um, you'll be able to access it. And let me know how things are going. Again, I'm very interested in helping you out as you're working through this material, and especially as you start turning in your homework assignments and and um, and looking at answers and trying to diagnose, you know, what you need to do to improve and how to get closer to mastery on this stuff. There's a lot of difficult judgment calls to make, um, and it can feel a little frustrating at times because there's not as many clear-cut boundaries for how to do that. Hopefully, the concepts are I've been able to explain in a very, you know, clear and distinct way. But uh, there's a difference between, like I've said before in this class, there's a difference between understanding the concept and knowing how to wield it, how to apply it into a case and to do a proper analysis. There's a lot of ways that I can be done more or less ideal. So be in conversation with me. Let me uh, be a help to you. Let me be a resource to you. I want to be your ally. Um, I, I have had very little contact with students in the class so far and I would love to have a lot more. So um, I, I'd love to have this be as uh, a more personal online class if, if possible. Um, so I'm trying to make ways for that to happen. So, But you can reach out to me at any time. My phone, text, email, I'm, I'm here. So let me know how I can help. I say that I think at the end of every video, but um, I really mean it. So hope you use me. Um, all right. Uh, good luck with the homework here, and I'll see you next time.